I've entitled this home retreat, Fear or Reverence. What should our attitude to God be? Should we fear God, be in terror of God, dread God, or revere God? It all began with a question. How should the Hebrew word pachat, which really means fear, be translated when applied to the attitude of a believer to God? Is fear too sharp? Should we be frightened of God? Is it inappropriate to have fear between lovers? Because that's what we are, lovers. Look at the creation story and you can have no doubt that there is love. God creates Adam out of love, arranging everything that Adam should be happy. When God realises that Adam is lonely, this is the moment for the creation of Eve. So God anaesthetizes Adam and draws Eve from Adam's side. And while Adam is still asleep, heals the wound so that Adam feels no discomfort at all. Then when the couple have disobeyed God's only command and are skulking out of sight among the trees, when God comes for an evening walk and perhaps conversation with them, at the end of the day, in the cool of the evening, God still loves the human couple enough to make them leather clothes instead of the ridiculous fig leaves that they've cobbled, cobbled together. And finally, they're expelled from the garden to prevent them doing further idiocy and making matters worse, now that they know good and evil that is, that their conscience is aroused. This myth is not a simple passing story of one incident. It expresses the permanent state and condition of humanity. We need to look, of course, also at the history of the relationship of God to the chosen people. The first great advance after the choice of the patriarchs to be God's special family is the revelation of God's name to Moses in the book of Exodus. <clears throat> this is the beginning of the intimacy between God and the chosen people, a major step forward in the relationship with God. I don't give my name to someone with whom I don't want to form a friendship. So when God at the scene of the burning bush gives Moses his name, that is already a sign of friendship. Every Hebrew name has a meaning, real or sometimes distorted, artificial. It's a special desert scene in the vast expanse of stony sand. I took the photograph when we actually had had a puncture. And there's only one type of bush growing on Sinai. The bush was on fire but not burnt away. It's not surprising that Moses takes off his sandals at this inexplicable sight. We don't, of course, even know what the name was, for only the consonants are written down. We don't know how it is pronounced, for it's too holy to be pronounced. At one time it was vocalised as Jehovah, but that's an absurd amalgamation of the consonants with the vowels of the Hebrew word Lord. We simply don't know how it was pronounced. And when Cardinal Ratzinger became Pope, his friend, the chief rabbi of Rome, asked him to prevent Christians from using any reconstruction of that name too sacred to be pronounced. Still less do we know what the word means. When the Jews of Alexandria came into contact with great Greek philosophy, the name was understood to be something to do with the verb to be, perhaps being itself, or perhaps one who makes to be. But the meaning is not given to Moses. Far from it, God's next statement, I am who I am, could be understood to mean I am who I am and mind your own business. 
It's not until things have gone radically wrong with the worship of the golden calf that, it, that the name is given a meaning. Hardly had the covenant begun when it was broken by the worship of the golden calf. Moses is so fed up with the people that he asks to die rather than going on trying to lead them. Then God promises to hide him in a cleft in the rock while God passes by so that may, Moses may catch a glimpse from behind while God cries out the meaning of the name and ever afterwards, but especially in difficulty, this explanation will be quoted up and down the scriptures. For Israel expresses the, con it expresses the concept of God. There is no fear here, let alone terror. God is a God of love. God calls out as he passes, the Lord, the Lord, God of tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in faithful love and constancy, maintaining his faithful love to thousands, forgiving fault, crime and sin, yet letting nothing go unchecked, and punishing the parents' faults in the kingdom, in the children and in the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. It's notable that on this renewal of the covenant after Israel's failure, there is none of the awesome manifestation of power shown in the first revelation of the name. Nothing of thunder and flashes of lightning, no dense cloud or trumpeting. Now is the time to show the mercy and tenderness of God. The fullness of God's love is seen in the treasure that the symbol of resident and residence of God's love, which is the ark, deserves. The Ark of the Covenant has kavod. For within it, or rather on top of it, between the two golden seraphim, is the seat of God's residence where man meets God. In the New Testament, the idea is put forward by Paul in Romans 3.25. The idea is that Christ is the helasterium, put forward by God, to unite humanity again with God, sometimes translated reconciliation. The ark is so sacred that it may not be defiled by mixing in with ordinary life. It must be pitched outside the camp. When Moses goes out of the camp to meet God in the tent of meeting, all the elders stand at the opening of their tents in reverent silence as he passes by. Again, a sign of reverence, <clears throat> but not of fear. The ark is a special treasure for Israel as a sign and vehicle of reconciliation. Why then the separation of these things from God? Why is the ark to be outside the, gate, outside the camp? Everything to do with God is awesome. A sign that ultimate power belongs only to God, especially anything to do with life and death. It is God alone who holds the keys of life and death. Anything to do with sex or the production of life is special. Who knows whether this particular act of intercourse will produce a conception, a boy or a girl. Similarly, after birth, a mother is pronounced unclean, for 40 days, not because she is engaged in anything sordid. Quite the reverse, she has been engaged in something glorious, the production of a new life, and that sets her apart for a time. Similarly, at death, the body and all associated with it is sacred because it has experienced the touch of God. Everything to do with God is kavod. Literally, this means heavy, weighty, something that presses down. Perhaps the nearest approach in English is impressive. This quality is acquired or seen in wealth, 
achievement, victory. Perhaps the real equivalent is majesty. God is kavod, God has majesty. This has the idea of separation, of awe, and amazement and appreciation. The aspect of joy and celebration is nowhere better seen than it is with King David. His joy at the installation of the ark in, in the temple. At last, David is able to make his capital the capital also of his God. As he brings the ark to Jerusalem, to the threshing floor which he has chosen and bought for the residence of God, the residence of God among God's own people, David dances with abandoned joy, careless of the petty restrictions treasured by Michal, the daughter of Saul, who has lost the kingship. And then David feasts the whole people on dates and raisin cakes, a moment of joy, not of fear of the kavod at all. I find this also in David's reaction to the death of the love child, the fruit of his adultery with Bathsheba. The child falls ill, and David's retainers are afraid to tell David when his son dies, for fear that David may do something desperate. When he notices them whispering, they tell him the dreadful news. So he gets up, goes to the temple to pray, and then, to their astonishment, takes a meal. In the face of death, there is nothing else to be done. God has ultimately intervened with, in the great separation. Why should I fast, asks David. Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but I can't bring him back to me. But the Lord's forgiveness is shown at the same time by the name of his son, Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord, a name given him by the prophet Nathan. Again, the reconciliation, the gentle forgiveness, not the act of any fierce God who is to be feared. What then is the great disaster of all disasters, the exile? Israel has turned its back on the Lord. The sin of Israel is shown in no doubt. The Jeremiah's prophecies of doom are read out before the king. As each page is finished, the king tears it out and ceremonially drops it in the fire as a deliberate sign of rejection. He rejects the divine warnings. And Jeremiah himself ends up being cast into the sludge of a disused storage pit. The time has come for the punishment of Israel, and a brief visit to the British Museum shows us the result. Babylonian tanks with battering rams, battering the walls of Jerusalem till the stones fall out. While overhead the defenders uselessly continue to loose off arrows at their attackers. Nevertheless, looking back on it, Isaiah, with all confidence, can proclaim the continuity of divine love. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, whom I have taken to myself from the ends of the earth and summoned from lands far away, to whom I have said, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be alarmed, for I am your God. I give you strength. Truly, I help you. Truly, I hold you firm with my saving right hand. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob, you insect, Israel. I shall be your help. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So the exile was a moment of reproof and correction not of rejection. The majesty of God is so great that it can use the infidelity of the people to renew and tighten the bond of love. 
Jacob may be a worm, Israel an insect, but the Lord is still the Redeemer. I shall be your help. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. To the exiles in Babylon, Ezekiel can still prophesy, The hand of the Lord was on me. He carried me away by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He made me walk all round among them. There were vast quantities of these bones on the floor of the valley, and they were completely dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I answered, You know, Lord God. He said to me, Prophesy over these bones. Say, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I am now going to put breath into you and you shall live. I shall put sinews on you. I shall make flesh grow on you. I shall cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesied as I had been ordered. And while I was prophesying, there was a noise, a clattering sound. It was the bones coming together, one bone to another. And as I looked, they were covered with sinews. Flesh was growing on them, and skin was covering them. Yet there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, the Lord God says this, come from the four winds, breath. Breathe on these dead so that they may come to life. I prophesied as he had ordered me, and the breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a great, immense army. The prophet's confidence remains unshakable. It may be a long-term view, but in the midst of seeming disaster, it's the love that prevails. To return explicitly to the original question, what is our reaction to the kavod, the weight of glory? Is it terror, fear, or reverence? I think that the strength and continuity of divine love rules out terror. There is never a moment when all hope should be abandoned, for God's faithful love, his hesed, will prevail in the end. On the other hand, the majesty of power and God, of the power of God, and the fallibility of us humans is such that mere reverence is not enough. Perhaps we should settle for dread, but dread always coloured with confidence in that divine majesty. And what of the New Testament? I and the Father are one, says St John. Jesus is the incarnation of that love and forgiveness made so clear throughout the Old Testament. That is the significance of the name of God as it was revealed to Moses. God bless you all.